fish, não é? Good morning and welcome to the Portuguese Language Day. My name is Carlos Almeida, and I am the new director of Luso Centro here at BCC. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the work of Professor José Costa, the first director of Luso Centro and the creator of this annual celebration of the Portuguese Language Day here at BCC. Unfortunately, Professor José Costa could not be here today, but send his regrets and best wishes for a successful event. I would also like to recognize Joanne Petrasso, our former administrative assistant who for so many years helped us in putting this event together and is now enjoying retirement and can now enjoy this event as an audience member. I ask you to join me for a round of applause for Professor José Costa and Joan Petrasso's many years of service to BCC. Thank you. We have an exciting program lined up for you today. And this year, we are starting a new tradition of including presentations by students from high schools in our annual celebration. This first year, students from Dighton Rehoboth Regional High School will be presenting. Any volunteer schools for next year? Teachers, please contact me after. But before we start, I would like to invite President Jack Breger, a staunch supporter of Luso Centro and all things Portuguese, to say uh, some welcome remarks. President Breger. Well, thank you, Carlos. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bristol Community College. Uh, some of you have probably been here before. We're so excited about Portuguese Language Day. And uh, there's a, a wonderful program lined up for you for the rest of the day. Uh, we're honored at BCC to have such a close connection with the uh, Luso communities uh, across southeastern Massachusetts and the Portuguese-speaking uh, population. We have uh, over, uh, just so you know, we have 12,500 students at Bristol Community College. It's the largest in southeastern Massachusetts, the largest uh, institution of higher education. And we have campuses in Taunton and Attleboro and New Bedford, as well as here, too, here in Fall River. Uh, in all of those places, I know that you know, uh, there is a significant uh, Portuguese population. Uh, and uh, so we're very proud of the connections that we have made. I tell people wherever I go, this is my 16th year, I can't believe it, uh, as president. And for 16 years I've been saying that uh, community is our middle name at Bristol Community College. And the community uh, speaks to our ties with not only the Portuguese uh, population, but uh, all of the communities across southeastern uh, Massachusetts. So I hope uh, uh, you will consider uh, moving ahead in higher education. Certainly we welcome you at Bristol, but anywhere you go uh, to continue the upward march uh, and your bri uh, brighter future for yourself. Uh, There's a wonderful program today. I'm going to get out of the way so we can enjoy it. Uh, please uh, uh, take advantage of the wonder wonderful resources that we have at the campus. Uh, if you have any time off, I'm not sure you have, it's a pretty tight time schedule, but uh, feel free to roam around and uh, look in at some of our classes and uh, the facilities that we have. Okay, I thank you very much. I'm gonna turn you uh, back to uh, the director of the whole program, Carl Dr. Carlos Almeida. Thank you. Uh, now some uh, housekeeping duties. I would like to take this time to recognize some people and our sponsors that made this event possible. Our administrative assistant, Jen Estes,
for helping in contacting the schools. Tanya Casey, administrative assistant of Division I, for sending the message to at everybody. Laura Carlson and the facility staff for the signage. Our always reliable Sean Elliott here in the Art Center. Honorato da Costa for his technical support and students from the Portuguese club. This program is sponsored in part by Camões Institute, Portuguese Council in New Bedford, Azores Bakery, North Dartmouth Stop and Shop, Mr. and Mrs. James and Sally West, BCC Portuguese Club, BCC Multicultural Committee, and BCC Division of Humanities and Education. Thank you. Is uh, Espírito Santo School in the house? Make some noise. Is Coil Cassidy High in the house? Make some noise. Is Dartmouth hi uh, High in the house? Oh, nice. Is Dayton Rehobot in the house? Right. Is Somerset Berkeley High School in the house? Huh? Oh. Is Stanton High in the house? All right. Is Sikon High in the house? Great. Thank you. You deserve another round of applause. Thank you, everyone. I hope I didn't miss any school. If I did, did please let me know. Which school? Durfee. Of course, Durfee. All right. I did that on purpose. The Durfee always comes and they walk. They are round around the corner. Thank you, Durfee. It is now my great honor and pleasure to introduce to you our Master of Ceremony for today's event. Dr. João Carlos Nuno Caixinha, Deputy Coordinator for the Portuguese Language Programs and Education Affairs in the United States of America. Dr. Caixinha has a lengthy curriculum, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to highlight a few. He was born on April 4, 1971, in Nampula, Mozambique. He has a bachelor's in languages and modern literatures, Portuguese studies and education by Universidade Nova de Lisboa. He has a postgraduate degree in education by the Department of Psychology and Science of Education of Lisbon. He has taught Portuguese and prepared Portuguese language teachers in the consular area in a pilot program in Bulawayo, Zimbabwe, and in the Escola Portuguesa in Harare, also in Zimbabwe. He has taught Portuguese language and cultures in the consular area in Andorra and in Cape Town, South Africa. He has also held a consultant position in the Portuguese Minister of Education and since 2010, he has been the deputy coordinator for the Portuguese language programs and education affairs in the US. Please put your hands together and welcome Dr. João Caixinha. Thank you so much. Bom dia a todos. Welcome to uh, Bristol Community College. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here today. 
and speak to all of you and special to the teachers and students from the different schools in, uh, in this area of New Bedford, uh, the consular area of New Bedford. So it's my great pleasure today to uh, celebrate the day of Portuguese language and the cultures of CPLP, which you'll understand later. And um, my job today is to announce uh, someone very important that has been doing a great work here uh, in New Bedford with the Consulate of Portugal. Uh, his name is Pedro Carneiro and he is the Consul of Portugal in New Bedford. Uh, Pedro Carneiro has got a degree in international relations from the Superior Institute of Social and Political Sciences in Portugal. Um, he's done an Erasmus program of the Catholic University of Louvain la Neuve in Belgium and he has a Master's of Arts in International Relations and European Studies from the London Center of International Relations and European Studies from Kent University in the UK. He was admitted to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a diplomat in 1997, and he has been working in Guinea-Bissau in 1999, in Prague, Czech Republic in 2002, and he was the advisor to the State Secretary of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation in 2006. He has also been the Chief of Cabinet to State Secretary of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation in 2009, and as well as Diplomatic Advisor to the President of Parliament of Portugal. Uh, as part of the State Port Protocol at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well in 2002, 12, sorry, and appointed Consul of Portugal in New Bedford in August uh, 5th of 2013. Um, it's a great pe pleasure to, to welcome him here to the stage to address you, and please give him a good uh, round of applause to, to Consul Peter Fernay. Thank you. Bom dia. Bom dia. Em inglês parece que se diz good morning, right? Não é? É. Good morning. Give me just a, one minute. Okay. I hope it works. Working? Yeah. Okay. Muito bom dia. Good morning, everybody. Great, great pleasure to be here again. I was here last year. I was here the year before last year. And uh, it has always been a great pleasure to, to address you uh, on this very special occasion when we celebrate the Portuguese Language Day, uh, May 5th. And I'm going to explain a little bit later why uh, May the 5th. Actually, yesterday I learned something about May 4th. My kids. I have three kids, they're 10, 8, and 6. And yesterday they told me, Dad, it's uh, yesterday. Today it's Star Wars Day. And I said, Star Wars Day, what, the, well, you know, what that means? Because it's May the 4th. May the, May the 4th be with you. <laughs> so I learned something new yesterday. I didn't know about that. But today, May the 5th, is the day of Portuguese language. And my first words are to uh, thank uh, President Srega for, the, for uh, welcoming, welcome, welcoming us here today, and also to Luzo Centro, and Professor Carlos Almeida, and Professor José Costa, uh, because you know, it's, it's an enormous effort to put this uh, together, this celebration, and, and they have been doing that with, uh, with, um, with, the, with the help and the support of, uh, of some of the people that uh, Professor Carlos Almeida just, uh, just mentioned. It's, it's a great tradition here at BCC, and uh, I'm you know, very happy to be here with uh, all of you, and I'm looking forward to being here again next year. So the consulate is honored to be part of this, of this program, and it's, of course, very glad uh, to be one of the sponsors. So I've been asked and Professor Tony Rodriguez told me just a few minutes ago, be short, be short. So I'll try to be, as, you know, very short. But I have a few things to share with you, so, you know, uh, 
please uh, uh, stay, with, uh, stay with me. So the, um, I was asked to say a few words about CPLP. What is CPLP? And in English, well, in Portuguese, CPLP means Comunidade dos Países de Língua Portuguesa. And in English, it's something like Community of Portuguese-Speaking Countries. But what is exactly CPLP? I think that a lot of you don't know exactly what is this organization. Well, CPLP is an intergovernmental organization for friendship and cooperation among Lusophone, that means Portuguese-speaking, nations, where Portuguese is an official language. It was founded in 1996 by this gentleman over here in Lisbon after many years of discussions, negotiations, and it's a multilateral forum uh, created basically to deepen mutual friendship and cooperation among its member states that are uh, spread all over the world. How many members are in CPLP? Well, uh, through successive enlargements, the union has grown from the seven founding states, and here are the presidents and prime ministers, Angola, Brazil, Cape Verde, Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique, Portugal, and Santo Tome and Prince. These are the founding members of CPLP. And today, it has nine member states, with Timor-Leste, or East Timor, that joined in 2002, and Equatorial Guinea, that joined in 2014. So today, we have nine member states, and you can see here the names of the countries again uh, in the map. So these are the member states that are part of CPLP. But CPLP is a little bit more complex, and it has associate observers. What are associate observers? These associate observers are other countries that don't speak Portuguese as their native language, but they want to be, they want to participate and they want to have, you know, participate in, in the life of the organization and to be part of some initiatives. And so these um, associate observers, they don't have a decision-making power because they are, after all, observers. But, uh, you know, through this organization, they can develop, strengthen the bilateral relations with the member states that, you know, in international relations is very, very useful. So we have, you can see them uh, in pink in the map, we have Georgia, Japan, Namibia, Turkey, Mauritius, and I think I'm not missing any. Turkey. Did I mention Turkey? I did. And Senegal. Okay, thank you so much. So. The organization has also consultative observers, and these are basically um, organizations that come from the civil society. Okay, so how does CPLP work? Well, the governance of CPLP is a little bit complex, but to make it very, very simple, I would say that we have, first of all, we have the conference of heads of state and government. They meet every two years, and it it's establishes basically the guidelines and the priorities for the organization. Then we have the Council of Foreign Ministers, and they meet every year, and it approves the more concrete plan of action. Then we have also the Permanent Steering Committee that uh, follows specific initiatives and projects, and it meets once a month. And finally, we have the Executive Secretariat, which is responsible for designing and implementing CPLP projects and initiatives. The Secretariat is located in Lisbon, in Portugal, and, um, and this, the, this, the Secretariat, or the exec Executive Secretary, has a um, two-year mandate, and it can be or he or she can be re-elected only once. So basically the executive secretariat is the, the body that works 
you know, on an everyday basis to make the organization function. Three main objectives to CPLP. Well, political and diplomatic cooperation. I could spend two hours talking about this, but I will just mention that through C CPLP, the, um, the, the, the member states can work together certain issues, they can help each other, they can um, also you know, coordinate positions in the international forums. For instance, when Portugal decided to run for a seat in the Security Council in the United Nations back in 2010, the first thing it did was to seek support from the member states of CPLP. And all the member states endorsed Portugal for this, and we actually got the seat. Now, for instance, the former Portuguese Prime Minister, Antonio Guterres, is running for Secretary General of the United Nations as well, and CPLP has already endorsed his, um, his candidature. So um, the good thing about this is that then the member states, Brazil, Angola, all the member states of CPLP, then they can help influence other member states around the world to support our initiatives. And the other way uh, round is, is true. Anytime Brazil or any other member state needs uh, the support of CPLP, we try, to, we try to provide that support. Also, CPLP and the member states of CPLP, they have a lot of projects in, in cooperation. They, they cooperate in various areas, health, education, defense, just, justice, environment, research. There's a wide range of projects that go uh, through CPLP. And the third objective is, after all, the promotion of the Portuguese language. And that's why we are talking here today in BCC, Fall River, United States of America, about the Portuguese language as well. Because back in 2009, in Cape Verde, and I, perhaps some of you are, uh, have relatives from Cape Verde, the Council of Ministers, back in 2009, the Council of Ministers declared this day, May 5th, the day of the Portuguese language and cultures in CPLP. And I'd just like to add that today, this year, 2016, um, in 58 countries around the world, we have more than 200 events right now where the Portuguese language is being celebrated. And with the support of Camões Institute, and the governments of the CP, uh, CPLP members. So, uh, just a few very uh, basic facts about the Portuguese language and why we celebrate this and why we say that Portuguese language is um, a, a very important language. More than 230 million Portuguese speakers represent about 3.7% of the world's population and hold approximately 4% of the total wealth. That may not seem a lot, but is a lot, I can tell you. Portuguese is the world's sixth most spoken language. Sixth, fifth, I've, I've seen different uh, ranks, but uh, it's definitely one of the most spoken languages in the world but I will stick with the sixth most spoken. Also, the Portuguese is the most spoken language in the Southern Hemisphere, and Portuguese is a mother tongue in five different continents, as we have seen in the map. Portuguese is the fifth most used language on the internet, and it enjoyed the fourth largest growth rate, and Portuguese is the third most used language on Facebook. So I hope some of you are using some Portuguese or Portuguese words on Facebook. And it has registered the highest growth rate. And with this map, we can see that Portuguese is not only a relevant language nowadays, 
but it's also a language that is growing, and it's growing fast. And you can see that, according to this map, to these uh, um, uh, figures here, we have the growth of Spanish and English, very relevant, and by roughly 2050, we will have around 350 million people speaking Portuguese around the world. It's a significant number. And I would like to conclude, and this was, I would call it a crash course on CPLP, very fast, just so you have, to have a, an idea what CPLP, the organization is, but I'd like to conclude by saying that the CPLP and its member states are working firmly to make the Portuguese language grow, make it more valuable and useful, and appealing to new generations, this is you, and to other countries. We have been working hard for that. We have been promoting a lot of events, and specifically here in the United States and in this coast of the United States, through Camões, Professor João, uh, João Caixinha, the consulates, schools, teachers, organizations. We have been promoting the language and the culture. And um, so we want the language to grow, to be more impactful on new generations. And just looking today to this beautiful and wonderful audience in Fall River, Massachusetts, I think we are on the right track. So enjoy the day, enjoy the day of Portuguese language. Congratulations to Luso Centro and to BCC, and congratulations to all you students that are learning the Portuguese language. Muito obrigado. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation. It was quite uh, significant, the numbers for the Portuguese language. Um, I have the honor now to present Paulo Pinto. Uh, Paulo Pinto is the executive director of the Massachusetts Alliance of Portuguese Speakers. Uh, he actually works Sorry. So I'm presenting actually the students from Dighton um, Rio Booth Regional High School. Thank you. Everybody. Uh, how are you all doing? All right, so I'm Brittany. That's Kylie, Ryan, Brooke, and Carissa. And we're the Portuguese students from Dighton Harbor Regional High School. And we're going to be doing a presentation for you guys on the immigration and the emigration from the Paisa Josefana Cush. Somebody call me. Somebody call me. Oh, this is on me. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so I'm Ryan. Oh boy, that's loud. Um, uh, my country is Brazil. Uh, I'm not Brazilian. I have red hair, so that's not true. Uh, the capital of Brazil is Brasilia, and uh, we're going to go to the next slide. Uh, oh boy, that's really far. Okay, so in Brazil, the number of Brazilians that immigrated to the United States is hard to determine exactly, as the United States largely considered Brazilians South Americans and categorized them as the whole continent in general. Uh, Brazilian emigration was primary to developed countries with many jobs which was the reason for the, their departure. Uh, they mostly went to the United States in regions such as the Northeast, 
Florida and California, but also went to other countries like Japan, Paraguay, Portugal, Spain, the UK, Germany, Italy, France, and Switzerland. Can you believe that? During the mid-1980s, a large population of Brazilians left the country permanently. Around 1.4 uh, million was estimated. This was due to a deteriorating eco economy, uh, which caused incomes to drop by over 30%. Uh, many emigrated to the United States and Japan during this time. Ever since the mid-1980s, people have continued to leave the country, which has only recently started to look better economically and politically. Uh, people also left because of the cheering infrastructure and the safety of the cities. Most of the population, 84%, moved towards the cities in search of work, which has led to the development of slums around these general large cities in Brazil. Uh, so people let, then decided to leave these slums to find a better life in more developed countries like the United States. Uh, so now P Brazilian immigrants are leaving legally, which has caused a m massive problems, but it's okay, don't worry about it. Uh, it's estimated that over 350,000 Brazilians are le living illegally in America right now. It's crazy stuff. Okay, we have Kylie doing this country. Here you go, Kylie. Okay, so my name is Kylie, as you said, and the next country I'm going on is Angola. The capital is Luanda. So here's a quick quote. This research resource-rich country, one of Africa's major oil producers, is also one of the world's poorest countries. Today, it is facing the daunting tasks of rebuilding its infrastructure and tackling the physical, social, and political legacy that has been marred by the 27-year-long war. In the United States, the abolition of slavery happened in 1865 until the 1970s, so few Angolans emigrated to the US, but in 1970s, so after the abolition, a large-scale Angolan immigration to the U.S. began due to regional wars in Angola. The Angolan Civil War fully began in 1975, but it didn't end until 2002. Initially, most Angolan refugees emigrated to France, Belgium, and Portugal, where Angola belonged to Portugal in colonial times, and they shared the Portuguese language. In the 1980s, the European Economic Community Organization put restrictions on immigration. This forced many of them to emigrate to other countries, such as the United States. Before that, only about 1,200 Angolans had emigrated to the US. Between 1980 and 1989, almost 2,000 Angolans entered the United States. And between 1980 and 2000, about 2,000 more arrived. And about 4,000 Angolans were registered as living in the United States in 2000 which in primarily the cities of Philadelphia, St. Louis, Phoenix, and Chicago, and closer to home in Brockton, Massachusetts, uh, a Portuguese-speaking Cape Verdean community was an attraction. And I also have the next country, it's Guinea-Bissau, and the capital is Bissau. The population is almost two million, and first I'll talk about immigration. So people immigrated from, or to Senegal, Guinea, Gambia, Liberia, as well as from Portugal, and about 15,000 individuals in the year of 2013 immigrated into Guinea-Bissau. In 1998, Guinea-Bissau entered into a civil war that lasted about one year, so 300,000 of Bissau's inhabitants were displaced, which caused many people to emigrate from Guinea-Bissau to other countries. And for emigration, people emigrate usually to Portugal, Brazil, Senegal, Gambia, Spain, and Cape Verde, and about 74,000 people emigrated from Guinea-Bissau in 2013. Hello, I'm Carissa. I'm going to be doing Mozambique. All right, the capital is Maputo. And a lot of immigration that happened, they went to South Africa, Zimbabwe, Portugal, Tanzania, and the United Kingdom. Um, right now, Mozambique is still having a lot of people emigrating out of, well, immigrating out of Mozambique and trying to get into South Africa. The Mozambique government has actually asked South Africa to increase the voltage on their gate in their national state park to, you know, like, keep Mozambique people in Mozambique. Um, the number of immig immigrants to South Africa are 462,000, Zimbabwe 160,000, Portugal 73,000, Tanzania 20,000, and the United Kingdom 7,000. These are rough, and these immigration statistics are based off of 2013. Right. 
Hello, my name is Ryan again. Um, so before we continue, I just want to talk about how we have two great Portuguese teachers at DR, uh, Mr. Augusto and Mr. Aguiar. So you guys want to stand up? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah, more to buy, yeah. So the next country we have is Sao Tome and Prince. Click that. Oh no, it moved. Uh, so the capital of Sao Tome and Prince is Sao Tome. Uh, in immigration, in the 1970s, there was a mass exodus of almost all true Portuguese uh, people living in the island nation. So everyone who was 100% Portuguese uh, left. So almost 4,000 Portuguese men, women, and children emigrated from this country. Uh, in 2013, over uh, 35,000 people emigrated to various countries around the world from this island. Uh, is it an island? Yeah, it's an island. All right. Uh, <laughs> over 18,000 left to Portugal, over 7,000 to Angola, over 6,000 to Gabon over 1,000 to Cape Verde, and then over 1,000 to Equatorial Guinea. So they really went all over the world. Uh, this one might also. Yeah, I right, sweet. So I'm Ryan again. <laughs> uh, the next country is Timor-Leste. Uh, so the capital of Timor-Leste is Dili. So immigration, uh, over 600 Portuguese and Timorese, Timorens. I really don't, yeah, okay. Uh, migrated to Australia during World War II. Uh, in 1975, many were evacuated to Darwin, Australia, during the fight for independence from Portugal, so in their civil in the war, and the threat of the attack of an Indonesian nation. Many of these people became permanent Australian residents, so a lot of these people are living in uh, Australia, Australia right now. So over 2,000 Timorian people uh, were recorded in Victoria, a city in Australia, in 1986. Uh, other locations include Brimbank, Casey, and Greater De Danong, which are all in Australia. Yeah, that sounds about right, yeah. And, uh, in 2013, uh, over 6,000 emigrated to Bangladesh, uh, over 2,000 to Portugal, over 20,000 Indonesia, and over 11,000 to Australia. All right, that's it. Sweet. There you go. All right. Hi again, everybody. Uh, thankfully, I have more to say about this nation. So this is Cape Verde, or Cabo Verde, if you're going to speak Portuguese or, you know, Portuguese dialect. It's capitalist Praia, and um, a lot of the people go to the United States, Portugal, Spain, France, Netherlands, Angola, Mozambique, and Italy, as well as Guinea-Bissau, Sotom, Princip, Nigeria, Senegal, Portugal, and Russia when they leave. But um, for Cape Verdeans in this area, if your family is similar to mine, they're, because of the Angolan civil wars and stuff in the 70s and stuff like that, there was an increase in immigration, particularly to the United States then. So that kind of accounts for it. Um, some places that, that immigrant, immigrants from Cape Verde have gone to in America, like Cape Verdean communities, can be found in places like New Bedford and Providence. So I'm Brittany, again. So I'm doing Portugal, and the capital of Portugal is Lisbon. Now, uh, just something to bring up, these numbers are based on 2013 estimates. Because of some political instability in the country, there is a lot of people that have been leaving, and so they're not really sure the exact number yet. These numbers also include people leaving from the Azores and Madeira, because they are considered a part of Portugal. And so they don't really get, when they do the census statistics, they don't differentiate between the three. And so when we do uh, the Azores and Madeira later, we just have a list of the countries because there are no numbers for how many people are leaving the Azores and Madeira. So people who are emigrating to other countries from Portugal typically go to France, Switzerland, the United States, Canada, Brazil, Spain, Germany, the United Kingdom, Luxembourg, South Africa, Venezuela, Belgium, and Australia. And so people, go into Portugal, and these are the actual 2011 numbers that we were able to find. Uh, people from Brazil, Cape Verde, the Ukraine, Angola, Romania, Guinea-Bissau, United Kingdom, France, China, Spain, Moldova, and Sao Tome and Prince technically go into the country. So we're doing the Azores, and this is going to be done by myself and Brooke. Um, so the capital of the Azores is Ponta Delgada on the island of St. Michael. 
And so, like I said earlier, we don't have the numbers for this because it is considered a part of Portugal. They don't technically differentiate the, the census statistics. So people from the Azores emigrate to Bermuda, Brazil, Canada, the United States. Well, Hawaii is part of the United States, but there is a large Azorean population in Hawaii too, and the Uruguay. Um, many immigrants come from Angola, Brazil, Cape Verde, Russia, and Ukraine. Uh, the next country is Madeira. The capital of Madeira is Funchal, and many um, the people of Madeira usually tend to go to England, France, Germany, the United States, Canada, Brazil, and Australia. And immigrants come from Brazil, the United Kingdom, Venezuela, and Ukraine. Such wonderful presentation of different countries. Uh, good round of applause to all the students from uh, Dighton Reboth Regional High School. Thank you so much for your hard work and the uh, help from your teachers. It's nice to see how many countries uh, speak Portuguese and all the cultures associated to it. So it's actually a plus on your CVs and in your life when you know a language such as Portuguese and that you are able to communicate with so many countries in the world, you know, and so many um, friends all over the world that you can make uh, throughout your life. Uh, I just want to make a correction. Madeira is actually not a country, it's an island, uh, and it's part of Portugal, of course, okay? So uh, now I will present uh, the director, the executive director of MAPS, Paulo Pinto, and he's going to make a presentation about MAPS, uh, the organization, and the Lusophone communities in Massachusetts. Paulo Pinto is the executive director of MAPS. He has served the Portuguese-speaking community throughout his career of more than 25 years in the health and social service field. He began working at MAPS in January 1994, serving as a program administrator for the agency's disease prevention and education program until late 95, uh, when he was promoted to the position of deputy executive director. He served as the agency's second in command until April 3rd, 2000, when he became acting executive director. He was appointed executive director by the MAPS Board of Directors on August 23, 2000. A native of Portugal who grew up in Mozambique, Mr. Pinto immigrated to the U.S. in 1980. He holds a B.A. in political science with a minor in English from the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, which is very close to this area, and a master degree in public administration from Suffolk University Sawyer School of Management. He received the Brazilian Times Community Service Awards in 2000, 2008, and 2012, and the Portuguese Heritage Award from the Massachusetts Portuguese American Legislative Caucus at the State House in 2010. He was also selected as a finalist for the 2015 Nonprofit Excellence Award in the Leadership by the Massachusetts Nonprofit Network. A founder of the Massachusetts White Ribbon Day, a statewide annual campaign promoted by Jane Doe, Inc. that recruits men to step up and speak out against violence against women. Mr. Pinto was named a co-chair of the 2012 White Ribbon Day campaign. During Mr. Pinto's tenure as executive director of MAPS, the organization has greatly expanded services and received many distinguished awards for its leadership and capacity to address the needs of the community. He is a member of the Governor's Council of, to address domestic violence and sexual assault, the Jane Doe Board of Directors, the Community Public Health Board and the Community Health Advisory Council of Cambridge Health Alliance and the Harvard Catalyst Community Advisory Board. 
He also is an author public for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Please welcome him with a round of applause, please. Thank you. Bon dia. Good morning. So bear with me as I put my PowerPoint presentation on the computer so that you can all follow with me. How's everyone doing? Good. Tudo bem? Tudo bom? Who's, who is uh, here from Portugal? There's a few. All right. Uh, what about from Brazil? All right, see, there's only two of them, but they make more noise than the Portuguese. We need to, to, to follow that lead. What about from Cape Verde? All right, so Portugal, Brazil, Cape Verde, those are the three main Portuguese-speaking uh, communities in Massachusetts. What about from Mozambique? I grew up in Mozambique. I was born in Portugal, so I'll, I'll, I'll be one person. What about from Angola? All right. Let me see if I can make this work. All right, so this works. Um, I am the executive director of the Massachusetts Alliance of Portuguese Speakers, uh, mostly, uh, most, uh, mostly known as MAPS, M-A-P-S. And uh, today, um, I want to say thank you so much for, to Professor Carlos Almeida for the invitation to be here with you and to share uh, with you uh, the story of MAPS and the Portuguese-speaking communities in Massachusetts. Uh, why am I here today, really? Um, I'm, I, I'm the executive director of an organization that provides health and social services to the Portuguese-speaking communities living in Massachusetts. Our job is not to promote the language. We're not, we're not educators. We're not an educational institute. So why uh, am I part of this um, uh, event today? Well, I hope um, uh, that uh, my reason for being here is because um, you know, to tell you and share with you why the language is so important and for many reasons. One, we, uh, as, uh, we utilize our language as a way to provide services uh, to um, a large number of, of immigrants living in Massachusetts and their families. So we are an organization that serves people uh, who uh, immigrated from at, uh, at least three main uh, countries uh, living in Massachusetts, from Portugal, Brazil, and Cape Verde. So uh, the organization was, um, is um, uh, dedicated to helping immigrants overcome barriers. Do this. Um, promote health and quality of life. Um, uh, build and unite communities. Maintain cultural pride. And we have been doing this since 1970. Uh, the history of the organization, um, basically, just to let you know that in 1970, um, uh, two organizations were created in the Boston area to help uh, then the mainly immigrants uh, that spoke Portuguese were all from Portugal. Uh, at that time, uh, Cape, Ver uh, Cape Verdeans were part of Portugal, so that was, they were included in that, under that umbrella. And there was hardly, an, um, uh, there was almost no one from Brazil at that point. So the, the two organizations were uh, the COPA, Cambridge Organization of Portuguese Americans, and SPAL, Somerville Portuguese American League. Those two organizations were created to really support immigrants uh, living in the Boston area. And, uh, uh, and there was a fairly large community living in Cambridge, Somerville, and uh, the north end of Boston. If you know that area, that's no, mostly known today uh, for the Italian neighborhood. Um, and uh, the, the, the purpose for creating this organization uh, was to serve and unite the diverse communities. Um, uh, Portuguese-speaking communities in Massachusetts, uh, like I said, uh, mainly from Portugal, Brazil, and Cape Verde, but there's a few people from Angola living in the Dorchester uh, Bo um, area of Boston and also Brockton. Uh, the mission of the organization is to advocate uh, for the Portuguese-speaking communities living in, in the state of Massachusetts mainly, but we also advocate at the national level. Uh, we overcome linguistic, cultural, social, and economic barriers, so we help um, people overcome all those obstacles and challenges. 
uh, we increase, um, through our help, we increase people's access to health, education, and social services. And um, we provide leadership and development, uh, community leadership and development. So basically, a lot of our staff uh, come in, are educated, and take on leadership roles in the community, um, uh, not only within the organization, but uh, as they leave the organization and join other uh, companies, other organizations, they really become leaders in many ways. We also empower our communities through civic and political participation. Um, and so you'll see, as I give you a bit uh, more a description about some of our services, how we are able to accomplish um, our mission. We, um, obviously, all of this is uh, dedicated to helping um, uh, Portuguese-speaking immigrants integrate into our community and be part of the American society. Um, and, uh, and then promote our, a strong ethnic identity and sense of community, which is really important. Like all of us, you know, not our first to succeed, we need to feel proud of who we are, right? If we don't know who we are, there's no way that we're going to be able to succeed in life. And so I'm hoping that at the end of today, maybe you can um, think that maybe you'll have um, a, um, an opportunity to build a career utilizing your Portuguese language uh, and your knowledge of the culture and to maybe even look at the field of social services and health services as a potential place for you and uh, for your future. Has anyone, uh, has anyone here ever thought of uh, doing social work? All right, so there's a few people. Oh, what about um, health services, going into medicine, um, nursing, working in hospitals, health centers? Fantastic. Legal services? Fantastic. So there's a lot of you who hopefully uh, one day can be employees of MAPS. How, is, how about that? No? All right. We'll see. Maybe, you, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll entice you by the, uh, by the time I finish my presentation. Program services um, um, at MAPS. One of the, the, the main programs that we have is our immigrant integration services. And like I said, it's designed to helping immigrants integrate and to build healthy, successful communities. Uh, um, so building healthy lives in successful communities is essential, obviously, for all immigrants. And we as immigrants contrib contribute greatly to the economic um, life uh, and cultural life of this uh, common off. Um, so we provide um, assistance with uh, um, applying uh, application for naturalization, so helping people become uh, U.S. citizens. Uh, we help um, many folks with housing and employment search, so finding a, a good place, a safe place to live, and even apply um, buy a, a, their own home in many cases, or uh, how, uh, help them apply for uh, employment and search uh, for um, employment opportunities. Uh, connecting people with health services and social services, teaching people um, uh, English, but also to those uh, families who have children who were born here who also want to learn Portuguese, we do that as well. Um, translation and notary services, that's part of, that's, those are the services that we do, um, including community activism. We do a lot of um, uh, voter education, voter registration, um, uh, do, uh, engage, uh, we engage the community in learning about um, the uh, politicians that are running for public office so that they can become uh, engaged in their communities. Um, so then we have another program, which is our family support services. I'll, I'll, I'll try to go quickly, and uh, uh, Professor Carlos Almeida, let me know if I run uh, late. Uh, just scream out my name, and I'll stop. <laughs> um, Family Support Services is a program that works, it's a clinical program that works with, um, with families and children. So these are children who are at, at risk for abuse and neglect. So these are kids, um, have you, you, probably you know some kids in your neighborhood or families um, who are abused and neglected and, um, by their families or, uh, or, or people they know. Uh, and we have to intervene to stabilize the family, to um, keep the family together as a unit. And so we are partners with Department with the state, the Department of Children and Families, uh, to provide the child and family civilization uh, and, uh, and save the family unit um, from being torn apart. Um, we also provide lots of in-home therapy for, uh, for folks, especially children who, have, uh, who are at risk, uh, youth who are at risk um, for, because of many different reasons, including sexual assault, uh, abuse, neglect, and so on. Uh, we also have a, a, a large program for elders, working with the seniors. Um, seniors are, 
And again, these two programs here are work with our two most vulnerable populations in, uh, that speak Portuguese, the children, um, who are completely dependent upon us as adults to take care of them, and sometimes we don't care for them appropriately, as you can see, and that it goes across all communities. It's not like this is more prevalent in the Portuguese-speaking population as it is in other um, mainstream communities. Um, you know, it just happens. These, uh, but so the most vulnerable population are the, are the children and obviously the elders. Uh, the elders, because why? Because they are uh, many of them are retired, have. Um, limited income, limited mobility, and uh, are very dependent, especially if they don't speak the language, on their families to care for them. And sometimes family and friends take advantage of, of, of seniors. Um, and so in order to break isolation and to promote uh, good physical and mental health for our seniors, we operate a senior center, as you can see in the picture, uh, where they uh, partake in lots of incredible activities. They also have a nutritional uh, culturally appropriate meals on a daily basis. They practice their language, they communicate with each other utilizing their own la language, and um, as play bingo, learn new, new skills, uh, become US citizens, um, and really participate in American society. Go on field trips, go visit the State House. They're already planning a field trip for the day of Portugal at the State House on um, June, uh, 10. I know it's actually the event at the Heritage Day of Portugal, the, the State House is, I believe, June 7th, is Tuesday, June 7th, I believe, right? Um, and then um, we also provide lots of social services and case management for, the, for seniors. So people who need help, uh, you know, uh, to obtain uh, public benefits, social security, retirement, apply for, uh, uh, for public housing, um, whatever they may be, you know, try to get an appointment with their doctor. Uh, we do lots of services. So in addition to providing, to having a senior center at our Cambridge office, we have um, uh, case management and social services um, for all of our seniors throughout all of our offices, and I'll tell you more about the different, uh, different offices that we have at MAPS. Then, um, more programs, domestic violence and sexual assault services. We're, as you can see, we're really a multi-service organization providing a variety of services. Why? Because immigrants, you know, have as many needs as everybody else really, and in some cases more because of the fact that they don't speak the language or don't know their rights and uh, they need a guiding um, help. And in many cases they're taken advantage by society because they come here and they're uh, forced to, to work or they get jobs where they're not paid appropriately or in this case uh, of domestic violence, sexual assault, sometimes um, uh, victims are in relationships that are abusive and are very violent and they stay in those relationships because why? Because they're afraid of the police or they're um, married to, let's say, an American um, and they want to protect their immigration status. They don't want to um, cause any problems. And many of them sometimes end up being abused, abused uh, or violated in, in many different instances and sometimes even killed. Uh, we've had unfortunate um, instances. Not a couple, of, about a month ago, we had a, a woman who was um, killed um, up in the Peabody area um, because she was in a, an abusive relationship um, that uh, lasted uh, longer than it should have. Um, and, uh, you know, we are, um, the picture that you see up above is a, is a campaign that we actually just finished during the month of April, which is the Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And it's a national campaign to bring uh, awareness about sexual assault to, um, to, to the masses. And unfortunately, sometimes even for, um, for younger people especially, sometimes people don't know when no means no. Does everybody know that? Do you all know that no means no? Thank you. Yes, then means no, right? No. Uh, no means no, definitely, and that's really important because sometimes people um, don't understand that and uh, um, uh, people get into trouble. So we provide lots of community outreach and education, such as the one that I just mentioned. We also do a lot of advocacy case management services for victims of domestic violence and sexual assault services. Um, and then 
uh, so that, uh, both, uh, that's domestic violence and sexual assault. Well, then we work with court uh, intervention services. These are people who are, are arrested um, by, um, by the uh, legal system uh, by, and went to court and the court uh, has found them to be guilty and then they, and they are sent to programs like MAPS because we're licensed by the Department of Public Health to care for people who are caught drunk driving or who are um, uh, caught um, abusing their spouses and, or partners. So we have a better intervention uh, for perpetrators of domestic violence, um, and where we work with betterers to engage them in uh, in behaving in changing their behavior so that they know how to communicate differently without uh, violence. And those who uh, were caught drunk driving, we also. Um, um, uh, work with them to make sure that they know the dangers of driving drunk. And uh, I can tell you that these two programs um, have um, high rates of success. Why? Because very few of, uh, folks that go through these programs re-offend or um, engage in these uh, high risky behaviors like driving drunk, which is very, very dangerous. You're not only putting yourself in uh, um, uh, your life in danger, but also the life of others. And when, uh, if you're a perpetrator and you are uh, engaged in a violent um, relationship with your girlfriend or partner or wife or husband, um, you're obviously putting your family in danger and you're putting yourselves in danger um, and destroying families. Um, so we are working not only with the victim and the abuser, uh, we're really trying to, cr to change um, systems and to engage in uh, social justice. Uh, the last, last program area that we have is our HIV AIDS um, and sexual transmitted infections program, educating uh, the, the, the population about prevention, education, and screening services. So not only do we educate the people about how to, to re, uh, reduce uh, uh, risky behaviors, um, and, but also to um, um, task people if they're at risk for HIV and, and other sexual transmitted infections. For those people who are task positive and we test people. We uh, conduct about, we test about an average of a thousand people a year uh, for HIV and sexual transmitted infections. We uh, then, um, uh, this past year we found we have tested six uh, folks who were HIV positive, about 30 some other uh, um, people who were positive for um, other sexual, other STIs, uh, sexual transmitted infections like gonorrhea, chlamydia, and so on. Um, and so, uh, we provide case management services. We help them get the treatment they need and the care they need um, and so on so that they don't reinfect other people. And obviously knowledge is power, correct? For many reasons. And so in this case, really, is if we feel that if people know their status, then they can take care of their health keep themselves um, healthy, but also they don't, they stop the spread of the disease to others, which is really important and, um, and much cheaper to do. So um, here on the left, um, to your left, you'll see one of our promotional campaigns that we did where, uh, where we work very closely in partnership with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, CDC, down in Atlanta. Um, it's a federal uh, grant that we have, but we also have federal contract with the Department of Public Health at the state level. And and we um, operate the National uh, World AIDS Day. Do you know when World AIDS Day is? No? Come on. World AIDS Day is? It's red. You can see that picture right there. What's, what kind of goes with red? Valentine's Day, that's appropriate. That, we usually have uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month in, in, in February. Um, but uh, and it's December. It's December 1st. December 1st uh, is World AIDS Day. I hope you remember that and take, and take notice of that because it's actually, it's, it's commemorated worldwide um, to bring awareness about the epidemic. Do you know that the millions of people have died because of the HIV AIDS? Right, and uh, you know, there are still many, many people in many countries where HIV AIDS is still killing people. And it's, and it's not, it's an unnecessary on death. Because today, if you know you have HIV AIDS, it's like having a chronic disease. Do you know what a chronic disease is? It's something like uh, what, having diabetes or high blood pressure. If you know you have it, you can get the medication and you can uh, take care of it, keep it under control and have a healthy, long life. But if you don't, 
it can uh, kill you. And so uh, it's really important. People still dying of HIV AIDS in this country, in the US. Um, so public service announcement, let me see if I can actually play it. Oh, maybe, maybe not. Um, I was gonna show you a commercial, but it's not working. Um, if I have time, I'll show it to you later. It's a commercial about maps that we did. Uh, we did it in Portuguese and also we did it in English for the media. And it was promoting our services to the population because we want everyone to know about our services. Why? Because we want people to take advantage of the services. We know that if people get the services they need, they can build healthy lives in successful communities. And that's what we want because we as immigrants, we contribute to this country. This country is founded on, uh, on immigration from all over the world. We are all all either first generation, if we were born outside of the country, and like me, I was born in Portugal, grew up in Mozambique, I am an immigrant, very proud. I'll always be an immigrant, even though I'm a US citizen, and I've been living in this country longer than I've lived any place else, right? Uh, but I am a, a citizen, um, an immigrant, and I am first generation. My generation counts. Used to be back then where um, the, the immigrants were not considered first generation. We didn't count. It was only the kids who were born here, the children of immigrants, who were considered uh, first generation. That has changed, and thank God, because that um, values the, immigrant, uh, the, the immigrants who actually made the sacrifice of leaving their families and their countries to come uh, look for a better life. In a, in a new country. So um, the, if you are, uh, if your parents were born elsewhere and you were the first one born here, you're second generation. If your kids then were born here, you're their third generation and so on. Um, we're building and, uh, uh, and uniting communities through our advocacy. We advocate for people's needs uh, for our communities uh, throughout uh, the national level. In DC, I was in DC in March. Uh, I'm always at the State House um, advocating for at the immigrant state, the State House. Um, I'm advocating for domestic violence, sexual assault services, um, um, I, as I am a member of the uh, statewide uh, coalition to end, to end violence against women. I am part of of the governor, I was appointed by Governor um, uh, Charlie Baker to be on uh, the governor's um, council, and uh, and so we're constantly at the state house advocating on behalf of rights and and uh, uh, of immigrants in general, and uh, obviously in my case, uh, Portuguese-speaking immigrants in particular, um, but also to really help um, educate um, legislators and public officials about the needs of our population and try to advocate for more services and uh, that can really promote the quality of life of our immigrant populations. We're engaged in many community events, we're helping raise money, bringing awareness, and so on. Um, we also uh, unite, uh, promote, un uh, promote unity uh, of our communities um, during uh, ver various events. One, namely, is the uh, our. Um, our gala that we happen that we that we organize every year, our um, annual awards gala um, every year honors and the the and celebrates the pride and the unity of our communities because we all know that what united we are strong stronger, that's for sure. And so we believe that if we unite our Portuguese-speaking communities, we can, we can create a, a stronger, united community that can have more uh, uh, power, right? We can also raise monies to provide services to the populations in a more comprehensive way. And that is why the organization is, a, is as large as it is because we don't believe in um, sep uh, divide and conquering. We believe in uniting and strengthening ourselves. That's our motto. And so um, our gala, for example, is an event where we honor the many people who have built healthy, successful lives in, the commu in, in, in this community. Um, um, we have uh, here this first picture to the left. We are honoring, uh, uh, this past year, we honored uh, David Seamus, who actually was from Taunton. I grew up in Taunton, Massachusetts, not too far away from here, uh, right next to Rehoboth. Who's here from, no, anyone from Taunton? All right. Go Taunton High. That's where I went. And Kohanit Middle School, Martin Middle, 
taught in high, so that's, that's where I'm from. I, but I, I went, I like you, I went to school, and hopefully all many of you will. I went to UMass Dartmouth, then I went for, to, to graduate school in Boston, and uh, got a job and, um, working in this organization. Today I'm the executive director of this statewide organization, and so I'm hoping that many of you will, will, uh, will do many wonderful things like that and even better. But David Seamus, who is from Taunton, um, not only did he succeed, even though he, um, he's born, he was born here, his parents are from Portugal, do you know that he's very proud today still of speaking Portuguese? And you know where he works? Where? It doesn't work your maps now. I wish it did. Um, he's, he works in DC at the White House. Absolutely, and I heard people say that. He works with President Obama. He's President Obama's advisor one of his senior advisors, the director of policy. Incredibly, incredibly important position. His job is working there every day. He goes every day to the White House. How fantastic is that? I got to visit him in, in December at the White House in his office, which was a fantastic ex experience. And he says, Paulo, every day I walk through the gates of uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, which is the address to the White House. I, never, I, I cannot believe that I'm actually working there. It's so incredibly uh, uh, powerful. Um, so anyway, and there's many other folks that we celebrated. We honored um, people from our communities who have built healthy, uh, successful lives and have, as a result, um, uh, uh, contributed to the success of our communities. The uh, maps uh, in Massachusetts, we, are, um, we have over 40 uh, staff working at MAPS. We have a board of directors that it has currently 12 board members. We have over 60 volunteers. We have an annual budget of almost $4 million. Uh, we uh, served last year 15,000 clients. And, um, and we uh, are always accepting interns, even from people from high schools and so on. We have many high school interns um, and college students who are wanting to learn about the work that we do and how they can make a difference and uh, contribute. And so we do all of this using the Portuguese language, meaning that po folks, to, in order to work at MAPS, you need to be able to speak two languages. You need to speak English and Portuguese. So, Knowing the Portuguese language is incredibly powerful, right? It can get you, in, uh, can get you a job. In this case, uh, we, at, working at MAPS, uh, all are bilingual, and some of us are multilingual. Um, and we, as, uh, as a result, provide many services to people who don't speak the language. We make their lives better as a result of our help. Uh, we have offices throughout the state, uh, namely in Cambridge, Dorchester, Somerville, Lowell, Brighton, Framingham. Uh, six offices. The, the, one, the picture that you see on the screen is the one of our main office. The headquarters is in Cambridge. Uh, you can find more information about MAPS on Facebook and our website. Um, I can also tell you that th these are the people that we were working with on a daily basis. We exist to serve these people. These are their, uh, according to the uh, um, American Community Survey, which is part of the U.S. Census um, Bureau, uh, in 2013 there were uh, almost 440,000 um, uh, Portuguese-speaking um, people and their descendants. And again, we believe that these numbers are much, much lower. We actually believe that the, the, the a truer estimate of the Portuguese-speaking population when you account for the second and third generations are, is much closer to one million and therefore about 16% of the population of the, of the state of Massachusetts. But according to the census, which is substantially in the counts of population, um, because many of us who are Portuguese are sometimes counted just as white, uh, Cape Verdeans many times are counted as African American, Brazilians sometimes are counted as Latino, Hispanic, and so the Census Bureau doesn't have a very good effective tool to, um, to count the population, and so therefore our population is substantially undercounted, but this is the official numbers, and that's all I can give you. I cannot give you an official numbers. Um, so um, uh, according to um, ACS um, in 2013, 6.5% of the population were Portuguese, which is substantial, and that makes Portuguese the third uh, most spoken language in the state of Massachusetts. 
Um, 140,000 of those were foreign born, meaning they were actual immigrants, uh, people born in, uh, and that came from three main uh, countries, um, Brazil, Portugal, and uh, Cape Verde. And you see the, uh, the, the number of uh, foreign born um, immigrants from these three countries in, 19, in 2013. I think that is really important to see. So now I've been told that I am done from Carlos, and I just wanted to quickly say that the Portuguese language in Massachusetts unites us, empowers us, serves people, builds careers like me and hopefully some of you, uh, promotes health, educates, and much more. Thank you so much. So thank you, Paulo, for the presentation. It was wonderful to know all these facts about maps and uh, the work that you do with the Portuguese, Brazilian, and Cape Verdean communities in Massachusetts. At this point, uh, I was told by Professor Carlos Almeida that we only can have 10 minutes of interval. Uh, and uh, after, we will introduce the Cape Verdean band with Jim Job on bass and vocals, Diki Anu Nobu on guitar, Claudio Ramos on keyboards, and Calo Monteiro on drums, and Benvindo Cruz on vocals. So I hope you enjoy your interval. Thank you. <laughs>